Hello, welcome back. Terribly sorry about that. Um, we had a few technical issues there, as you, you might just have noticed. Um, would you believe, after 10 weeks of doing live post-Wentworth chats, the final week, and we managed to somehow break the internet. But we're going to crack straight on, and I'm going to invite our guests to come and rejoin, and we'll carry on with our chat. So um, please come back on screen, Pamela Rave and Kate Atkinson. Hey, Yay. we're Yay. back. We're we back in the room. We broke That's right. I reckon that we broke the internet, but I, I think it's the ghost of B. Smith just getting her revenge. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> it's it's been a couple of days of technical issues, hasn't it, for uh, for Wentworth chats? Yeah. It's the it's, it's, it's the era we live in, unfortunately. But I mean, yet, communication is great. Yeah. But we are, I mean, I'm in Sydney, Pam's in Tasmania, you're in the UK, you know, it's still a, it's still a miracle. It's a miracle. And, and we're talking. Yeah. yeah. Hey, look, and we're getting comments on the bottom as well. Here we go. Hello, Leanne. Lovely to have everybody here. I did, as we were talking, I must admit, I was wondering why I wasn't seeing any comments from people along the bottom. I just thought they were so shell-shocked to see you both on screen. They, they couldn't type. It all makes sense now. Oh, I see, and I want to see them. So if I go fisheye like this, it's because I'm trying to, oh, oh hello, Gregory. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I know that's a bit terrifying, but I just want to see what's on. <laughs> well, you see, but I'm doing this you... on an iPhone, and even with my specs on, I can't, I can't see anything. <laughs> you've, you've given me the perfect segue into um, my new opening question. You said that that was a bit terrifying. Can we talk for a moment about the scene in the freezer? Where Joan, oh. Joan emerges. Yes, go ahead, talk. Uh, well, <laughs> I, I take it it was an intentional homage to, to horror films. Uh, that's a question for Matt King, really, I think. Um, uh, the director of that particular episode in terms of how it shot. And obviously, there are, you know, when you look at it, you go, this real... Uh, reverberations there with Ringu and you know all sorts of uh, uh, horror films. Uh, I think with the writers, I mean obviously that they they really wanted that kind of uh, tussle and tension between Eve Wilder and Joan Ferguson, and the notion that if somebody was going to try to enclose or well, first of all try to succeed in getting rid of Joan, they they weren't. Uh, but but the idea of the kind of um, the parallel between being buried alive in a coffin and being locked in a freezer, and mm -hmm. you know, and then it just becomes about how the director chooses to, um, along with the performance, chooses to, uh, and stunt people interpret the scene. It was great fun to do, I have to say, um, and hard to, to uh, resist some of the more camp elements. I think of the performance. I, I, I did love, I did love the hand the bursting out. Um, it was so very it was Freddy Krueger or. Um, Michael yes. Myers style, brilliant. Yeah, and a little and a touch of uh, Carrie, the movie. You know that the, the hand coming out of the grave at the end. Of, Definitely. Yeah. Could could only have been improved if you'd emerged wearing a hockey mask. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you mentioned Tina. How was it having uh, Tina Bursal on set and working so um, intensely with her? Uh, fabulous. She's a, a, a gorgeous creature and we had a lot of fun doing our scenes together and it was obviously a very kind of close relationship that, and it kept me away from Kate Atkinson for a while, which uh, that, that made me <laughs> sad, but you know, no. she's, she's a wonderful person and a uh, pretty glorious actress. Well, is that Tina? Uh, had you worked with Tina before? Uh, yes, but only once. I mean, I've known her for years and years and years, but uh, the, the only other time we worked together was in uh, a little um, made-for-television movie in 1987. Oh, oh my God. God. Yeah. Wow. Now, before, before we, were, we were thrown off into the, into the ether somewhere, um, we were talking about the, the penultimate episode, Seen in the Cell, um, which features a line, Kate, that you delivered to to Joan, or, or Vera delivers to Joan, which I think is going to become a fan favourite. Um, mm. Would you like to say it, John? I'd love to hear you deliver it. Oh, no, I'd, I'd like to hear you hear you say it, really. <laughs> Was that the one what's your in game? And I'm too polite to swear in front of you as well, so I couldn't say it properly. <laughs> oh, 
Is it is it the one where she says, "So what is your end game, you crazy fucking lunatic"? That's the one. I mm. suspect you're mm. going to be asked to dedicate that quite a lot in future. Mm. Do you know? Um, there's another. Sorry, this is just slightly off piece, but there's this other line that you said last night, Pam, which I had to deliver in a previous episode, and I could not sell it. I was like, I can't do this. I can't do this. And it was that Lou Kelly killed your goldfish. And then you yeah. said it, oh. and she killed my goldfish. And I was like, "That's that's a that, that line is." Hilarious. I know it shouldn't be funny, but it was that hilarious. that was the most difficult. I thought you cannot make me say this, please. You cannot make me say this. And then there was well, much discussion with Kev, Kev Carlin about how to. Yeah. yeah, I think the reason it worked was we both said it, and we both because it was a ridiculous, it was a ridiculous line. Anyway, yeah, very good. Yeah, she killed my goldfish. Um, I was about to mention that line. I thought it was brilliant. It 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 was such a serious scene, and then just dropping that in mm. just just added a, a little moment of lightness. Um, mm. And when you said it this evening, I was watching live. Um, it popped up on my phone. Someone messaged me just that line and um, with a laughter face. So I think people really like it, even if you <laughs> even if you weren't sure I, yourself. I, I like to think too that in these just these last twenty episodes, um, that um, particularly where Joan Ferguson. Um, thought she was on Sol Dryson, that it released a slight sort of heightened dry sense of humour that had not mm. necessarily, that had been very submerged in the previous episodes and previous seasons. So that was the only way I could justify it. <laughs> I can ask you, um, obviously over the last 20 episodes, um, Pamela, you've had the, the story arc, the, the Kath Maxwell story arc. How have you kept it straight in your head at which stage of Kath you're at? Um, well, the, the writers kind of give you some pretty strong kind of um, anchors or what do you call those things, you know, when you're mountain climbing. Um, you know, touch points, things to uh, slalom flags, whatever, where so you know where you are in that journey. Um, and then very often, um, you know, the, the drama was about the push-pull between those two parts of her personality so um it wasn't particularly i mean what was difficult was uh, i found the, the first 10 episodes of um um season eight where well the first what was eight after she'd had the blood of the head where she had to inhabit completely half maxwell and that that was tricky because it was just you sort of felt well wait a minute uh, where's joan and it, how much do i have to keep elements of that persona um, alive, even though obviously Kath Maxwell, or the woman who thinks she's Kath Maxwell, is not aware of them, but I as a performer mm. technically need to kind of keep elements of the characterization alive for the audience. Mm. So um, that was a very, can, you could, Kate, talk. <laughs> in, a, in, a, in a similar vein, although Vera hasn't been going through um, a traumatic personality disorder, mm. Vera's character has evolved so greatly over the nine years, so mm. emerging from under her her mother's control initially. Mm. How have you found that journey to go on? Well, well, before I answer that, I was just thinking as Pam was talking about the, the those multi layers of the Kath Maxwell Joan Ferguson um, story. I feel like my job was a lot easier in that it, it was a departure for Vera because it became such a toxic obsession. But my response to the Kath Maxwell Joan Ferguson dichotomy was um, very unnuanced. I mean, she just was obsessed that she was faking it and that I was going to prove that that was the case. And but the reason it was kind of a departure for Vera was that it became such a um, you know an unhealthy obsession. But in a way, I kept thinking about it a bit like the. Um, I don't want to be derivative, but I kept thinking about it a bit like the Sherlock Moriarty kind of um, adversarial relationship, where there's a kind of a pleasure in the, you know, like like Vera was like, I'm the genius, I'm I'm the only one, I'm going to get this person. Um, so in a way, it was it was different for Vera. So it was a it was a, a challenge for me in that respect, but not as um, yeah multi dimensional as the the material that Pam was having. To navigate, so I had an easier job, I think. 
Oh, come on. I mean, because I think, do you remember we chatted about this, that the, um, I also think that what you had on your plate was that as, as Joan Ferguson sort of disappeared or got deeply mm. submerged um, uh, under Kath Maxwell, she st Joan started to um, arrive in Vera Burnett. Mm -hmm. Remember, you were practicing your twitches. You were practicing yeah, your was. twitches. I was. But I mean, but I mean that 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 pressure was that the that that, mm -hmm. obs that toxic obsession was actually transforming Vera's character. So you were dealing with a, multiple layers of a sort of different person kind of rising up inside you too. So I think it was just yeah. kudos to you, Kate Atkinson. Yeah. Okay. Yes. But again, you know, and going back to your previous question, John, the journey again. There are footholds. The writers give you all of these. Um, you know, in fact, if anything, you know, they, they they don't make it easy for you. They do make it easy for you in a way. You have to, inha you know, they tell the story and you have to find a way of honestly inhabiting it and and making it, um, even though it's big and it's camp and it's um, crazy, you've still got to find some kind of truth in it. And um, so that was my job. But the journey was their creation and and... You know, when you start a show, you don't know that nine seasons later, you know, which characters are going to be there, which aren't, and what's going to keep the story. So we're all still kind of slave to a story. We're slave to the world of Wentworth. Um, and if you still happen to be there, then they've got to find, you know, um, you know, the, the way that you that you fuel that world. Um, and so I was lucky. I was lucky. And um, uh yeah, had 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 there not been that evolution, if there hadn't have been that tran that transformation, it wouldn't have been um, as fun, you know. So no. they lucky me. And of course, in the final moment of the last episode, we see a resolution for for both characters as Joan departs and 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 Vera is is lying there in the grass. But what do you think is going through both their minds at that moment? Well, they go their separate ways. I, okay. Well, I think for me, it's it's uh, it's a really brief moment, but it's a more not a more telling moment, but there's a telling moment in the scene after Ferguson disappears into the night mm. that I I'm, I'm given multiple opportunities to tell Will or. Um, Jake, that she's still out there, and I choose not to, you know. So I, mm. I quite liked that that moment, you know. Um, that was the kind of born free moment for me, where I was like, I'm just going to let her her roam free, like the wild animal she is. <laughs> um, but in the moment where she's leaning over me and she says me, it is, you know, in the moment as Vera in the moment, if I was actually trying to kind of imagine what she was thinking, she's thinking, oh, my God, she saved me. Is she now going to kill me? Then she gives me this, um, you know, this revelation about why she's going to let me survive. And it's, I mean, there's so many things. And I'm also just being strangled. So I'm, you know, kind of half out of it. So is it real? Is it not real? Is it, it was, it was, um, quite a moment and yet I found on the night it was a lot of fun <laughs> still a lot of fun <laughs> it was a pretty beautiful night I remember it was very mm. balmy and quite warm and um I can I, I I agree with you Kate too that I, I when you asked that question John I, I all I could think of was the scene that follows when as you say mm. Vera Bennett has an opportunity to um to say where John Ferguson well, has been, if not where she's gone, um, that I feel that in that particular moment, and I'll go back to when before we had our technical difficulties, and I don't know whether we, anybody was listening other than us two, um, <laughs> that, that the scene that the, the scene before that, the last encounter between uh, Vera and Joan, um, when Vera comes into that cell to say, you know, what's your end game, you, you know, lunatic. Um, and I didn't have any words particularly. And uh, I, I remember that right from the whole courthouse scenes, 
Joan Ferguson was relatively nonverbal, and there was some very intense looks that were going on between Joan and Vera, particularly from Joan to Vera. And uh, certainly in that scene, I felt like Joan really was wanting Vera to see who she was, to see her, to tell her who she is. And so for me, when you ask, what do you think, in that final moment, you know, she's obviously been holding on to that because she answers that question. You asked me, mm. what was my end game? And this is my reason. That there was a moment where finally they are, certainly in Joan's mind, the closest there have ever been. And yeah. that there's an unspoken pact that is sealed in that moment, which results mm. in Vera not giving the game away later, but that they are you know, they are almost kind of like one mm. and then they're gone, both holding on to their own secrets. Mm. Well, I must admit, watching the episode today, I, I did think for a moment that Joan was going to kiss Vera. It, she's, always, got she's always almost about to kiss Vera. <laughs> always. I, I love that bit where the tendrils of stringy hair dangling down almost like little tentacles mm. on your cheeks there no oh. yes yeah i know i know it's irresistible, irresistible. I, know. <laughs> I have to say what my can i just say what my absolute favorite scene in the entire final episode was though and i yeah. mean this in the kindest way kate because it was you and, and but it just made me uh laugh so loud it resounded amongst the surrounding Tasmanian, southern Tasmanian hills, is that when you came out to check the brawler mm. and and um, Kev Carlin had, and, and Daryl Martin, uh, DOP, had framed the youth from the inside the cab looking at just you looking through the windows. You were in this perfect little frame. And then you just did this thing, and I can't do it, but it was, like, it was just like it was either Thunderbirds ago or maybe a bit of Wallace and Gromit or, you know, you just went... And it just was sublime, and I'm oh. thankful for that. It's my pleasure. I mean, it's extraordinary. <laughs> you know, I hope it doesn't. I certainly was not bored by the line. I'm never bored on this show. But you do look for little moments. You do look for. It's, there's always a little bit of comedy, and some characters get to do more comedy than others. Vera is not one of them. So Jesus, when I can find a moment, so <laughs> I milk it. Well, it's been such it's been it's, such a joy actually somebody said this in the went with reunion thing that that, that um about the as the stories have become uh, uh, more populated the the ensemble has grown and grown over the seasons um and you're so like kate says you're so you you, you never know whether your um, your character will continue or not but you're in the little hands of the gods or Marcia Gardner and and the producers and but basically you are always aware of this expanding very rich landscape and 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 looking and asking what is my role in it and how do I keep the balance and serve you know uh, serve story and serve the ensemble in the best way you can before I move on to a, a, a separate subject, can I just ask one more question about that? Uh, that's uh, seen out in the grass. Um, Pamela, w was it you actually carrying Kate uh, towards the camera? What do you think? Of course. <laughs> well, I assume so, but you never know. It's television. It's like magic. I have sort of thought that I, my, hips, my hips and thighs would have given it away. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Although I don't know that I could do it now. I was, and that made me very sad last night, actually, is that um, I, I, I broke a wrist recently in a, a live mm. performance that I was doing and um, my hand's still not right. In fact, you know, I can go thumbs up with this hand and I can't actually oh. get thumb up. And I thought, I wouldn't wonder, I wouldn't have been able, I would have had to do a fireman's lift and have Kate oh, over my shoulder no. because I don't know that I could have helped. No, her no, that. we like the Frankenstein lift. That was, yeah. You know, we, oh, yeah we, we practiced it to make sure, you know, that it was safe. And, you know, we were on slippery, because at night the grass was slippery. Yeah. So it was, you know, considered a stunt, you know, so mm. there were, you know, we, it was all safe. And yeah. I, I, at lunchtime, I'd make sure Pam never watched me eating dessert. I'd just squirrel away. <laughs> <laughs> Pack on an extra few kilos that she'd never know about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Now, uh, Teresa's just asking, um, what have been your favourite scenes to film together throughout the seasons? Hello, Teresa. Oh, gosh. Oh, I know Teresa. Teresa runs the, yeah. the film tape. Yes. And sent me a gorgeous birthday. Anyway, I'm oh, sorry. I know she's, who you are. Uh, she, she's a wonderful woman and a great supporter and, um, you know, mega fan who's been so loyal and mm. um, love it a bit. Thank you for all you do, Teresa. I always send her old fashioned letters because I'm not on Facebook. Um, mm. Favourite scene, so, Pam? Oh. That's tricky. That is oh, tricky. Too oh, many. I'm going to go top of the head, top off the top yep. of my head. Very early days. Uh, Joan befriending Vera over a few glasses of vodka in the office. Oh, yeah. And it was, yeah, early, that was fun. it was early days and I typically um, was probably having a bit of an overthink about how I would or should or we would play it. And then it was at the very end of the day and it was very fast and we had to cross shoot it and it was chaotic and fast and fun and all all inhibitions fell by the wayside and I thought that was fun. And one of the wonderful things about, I mean, uh, um, um, DOPs and um, directors hate cross-shooting because, well, particularly the camera crew hate cross-shooting because you have to, have to make compromises in terms of lighting and things like that. But it's wonderful for performers because you can actually be responding in the moment to what the yeah. other, other person is doing and they're feeling it. It's, you know, it's a very lively. I think, was that almost our, the first scene that we shot, Kate? It was very early on. It was very I like early a, on. And but, I, but almost the first thing we did together. And yeah, it was pretty special. I, I have a very strong memory of you you coming into my office and you had a big bun on the back of your head. That was a prank, though. That was I know that was a prank. <laughs> actual scene. Um, <laughs> I love the scene, to be honest, I love the scene where it was it season four. Um, or three, uh, three, I think, where, where I um, I was losing my whatever and I slapped your face. Mm. I thought that was a pretty, that, that, that whole little, the tension that was moving through that relationship during that, oops, sorry, just garroted myself on my own microphone cord. Um, that, that, those things were really delicious to play. And then I certainly just, didn't, I very much enjoyed the scenes that we had in those final 20 episodes here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I reckon the first no. time I got to wear the governor pants and come down to you in the cell, it was a bit, it was one of those kind of Clarice Starling, Hannibal Lecter things. Oh, yes, that was great. Got yeah. to see, there's too many. I yeah. loved walking out in the yard with you, you know, me, I'm like twice your size, as yeah. we came around the corner to see the graffiti on the a wall. Oh, yeah. <laughs> in fact, any of our walking scenes where I had to take two steps for every one of the hands, um, <laughs> I, yeah, there was a certain comic, comic dimension to that which I liked. Uh, oh, Zoe's got an interesting question here. Uh, Pamela, can you finally share what it was that you whispered to Vera's mother? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Kate, do you remember? Because I, I actually... Oh, I, I, whispered different, I whispered different things every time, so I don't know what tape they used. I don't know, Pam. This would be as much a revelation for me. I remember thinking what Vera thought she might have said, like as Vera thinking, what has this, um, this witch woman said to calm my mother down? What could she have possibly said that I wasn't I a complete waste of space? I, I was hit on the back of the head, so I can't really remember. That's what I would say. Um, I, I can't remember. I, I remember one version of it was something to do with the fact about Vera being very good at a job, and mm. all that was, that was something about. And then what other ones uh, uh, that were to do with, um, you know, you know, Vera wants you dead. You, I can't even remember. I can't. Even, no, I, honestly, I'd be making it up now, so I'm not even going to bother. Fair enough. Now, um, you mentioned about the scene. I think most of have seen it with the the giant bun. Uh, you came as a prank. Um, what did you think about the decision to end the final credits with outtakes and bloopers and, and shots of you having fun on set? Wasn't that great? I, I loved it. Was it. Very, it was beautiful. Particularly I loved, loved it. it finishing on Chris McQuaid, um, you know, Jack's Holt. 
lovely. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. And, oh, the, and the lovely nod to Prisoner as well with the theme music. Absolutely. Yeah. Just, yeah. I know. Yeah. I, had a, I had a slight inkling. I don't know why. I just, a couple of days ago, I thought, I oh, wonder if I'll do that. So I was delighted to see them to use that. That was great. Oh, and Pamela, I loved, I loved you in the button. Where you're just like, I, I missed the button. <laughs> missed the oh. button. <laughs> that, that was another pencils moment. I have to tell you, the yeah. number of times that that happened. It's really, really hard to reach backwards without, and you know, no matter how much I looked and sort of spotted it and everything like that, I just I missed that. They, they probably they could have had a you know a sixty second thing of a cut together. Many times I missed that. <laughs> I think because I'm watching the episode again. Um, I think this, this, the cut they used, you actually do turn around and look before you before you press it. Yeah, no, but that was no. There was two, no because that's the second time. That's different. That's when I'm coming. It, it's just there are different reasons why there, there are choices behind all these things, John. <laughs> you can't always hit that in the same way. No, um, obviously the whole world was hit by. Uh, a small pandemic um, while you were filming. Did that have um, much of an impact on on the script? Did certain scenes and storylines have to be reworked at all? Yes. Yeah. Um, there were a couple. Um, I don't want to say which ones. <laughs> um, but look, the general ethos when we came back was that um, you know, we were really the first show in Australia other than Neighbours, which mm. actually went back to filming after Tools Down for over three months. So um, there was no television production in Australia. Neighbours agreed to go back, but they observed certain measures that in a prison show we just simply could not observe. So things like social distancing and, um, you know, obviously physical contact and we just can't make Wentworth without that level of intimacy and, you know, you know, we're literally spitting and throwing ourselves at each other all the time. Um, so we had to wait longer and come up with different measures. Um, so in terms of the general character of the show and the style of the show and the impact of the show, we were not prepared to compromise on that. So we had to wait so that we could do that safely. But there were a couple of things um, that, and I won't mention particular storylines because I think what we got was, you know, what we got. Um, but we had to limit, you know, the, the world of Wentworth is pretty much within the walls of the prison, but we did have some other locations outside of the prison that we had to lose because it was just not, um, you know, possible to traipse a crew and cast around to, to other locations. One of the, you know, criteria that allowed us to keep filming was that we were kind of a hub. We were kind of like a, you know, a, uh, bubble related hub yeah mm -hmm. um so we lost some um some locations and we lost in my storyline i think i can say this because it you know it, it it didn't create too much um problems but i obviously couldn't have grace we couldn't have a baby on the set so um so uh, there were ways we worked around that. And obviously, you know, the story is consumed by other things. I was more personally devastated because I had, had, in a deeply unprofessional way, fallen in love with that child. Um, she was oh. just, oh, uh, you know, I am zero clucky. I'm zero clucky. And this child was just, so we, we couldn't have little Gracie. Um, so that did affect um, some things, but... Um, I also think we can mention too, uh, because of the, the well, the, the COVID safety protocols that we were adhering to, and there was a Bible that was so thick that our line producer Sue Edwards and and um, um, and Brett was also very much involved in creating this thing, which became a kind of uh, well Bible for the industry, not just in Australia but around the world, because we were one of the first people that were going back to work uh, at the height of the pandemic last June year ago June um, but because of that as Kate said we couldn't um, we had to suddenly restrict there couldn't be location work and there was one storyline which I think Marcia Gardner has already spoken about so I feel I can mention it too because I'm really sad that that um, Wentworth couldn't include this element and it was uh, it revolved around when Rita Connors 
uh, went back to farewell her dying father. There was a whole storyline there about her encountering her, her, her mob and, and um, in the end they just felt that at that, that time they couldn't risk um, bringing a whole bunch of people in from mm. interstate and, you know, and then making them return to vulnerable communities or whatever it is while we were in that particular thing. So they had to alter that storyline. And um, I'm, I'm sad both for, you know, Leah and the Rita Connors story that that's missing, but also in the balance of the whole series. I think that's, yeah. um, that was sad to see that compromise have to be made. But hey, as you say, okay. we're in a pandemic. I mean, there were other. I mean, there were other more dramatic compromises that could have been made. I mean, I'm a Melbourne resident, and some of the cast are, but a lot of our principal cast are not from Melbourne. And um, you know, had we known that that lockdown was going to go for as long as it did, we could have lost Susie Porter, we could have lost Robbie, we could have had cast members yeah. just go, "I I need to go home," and we couldn't cross. It's it's different in Australia. We have a uh, a federal government, and we have states. And um, the states during the pandemic came up with different state um, border restrictions. So we couldn't actually go um, between states. So if you didn't live in Victoria, um, you know, a cast member could feasibly have said, well, I I'm not prepared to stay here. We don't know how long this lockdown's going to go. And everyone stayed and it was, it was tough. It was really tough, but it meant we didn't have to lose those, those characters and those stories. Mm. Now, as you can imagine, there's a, a lot of fans out there who aren't really ready to completely give up Wentworth and, and the, the world it's created. And in this, this TV industry now of, of spin-offs and franchises, do you think there's scope for Wentworth spin-off of any type? Are we going to see, I know, Joan and Vera in their own Laverne and Shirley style sitcom? Oh my God, I love Bert and Shirley. Why did you bring that up, John? Now I'm like, mm. no. I just think it'd be brilliant. <laughs> yeah. they, they'd be such a good, yeah, yeah. Odd, odd couple, wouldn't they? You know. Yeah. <laughs> You'd have to ask the production company and the writers. I have to say, I, I'm sure there's room for for um some imaginative extrapolation. Um, I I think Vera's done for me. Um, I don't know what else they might do with the right. other characters that are, you know, there are other characters that were new to the yeah. show and were ready and raring to keep going, but, you know, nine seasons down for Vera and, you know, you don't want to outstay your welcome. So I don't know no. what the other... I think the wonderful thing, though, is that the kind of the, the prison environment is just a hotbed for stories, for drama. Yeah. And... And it's a revolving door of, um, well, some people don't make it out or don't make it out alive. Some people do, are released and have a life beyond. Uh, whatever it is, there are so many stories that are ongoing from this particular iteration of Wentworth Prison. Uh, but there could be so many more as well um, in, some, in, in a whole new creative team's hands. Um, I agree that I think, as Kate says, you know, our, our, we've done our time. It's, but there's not to say that somebody else won't get a there may be sentence. More, there may be more stories to tell. Who knows? Um, a question up. here on the bottom saying, um, what, what are you getting involved in next? Have you got um, projects uh, up and coming Kate, or you've just Kate, involved Kate's in? Kate's got something very exciting. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh, I, 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 uh, well, I don't know if this will make it to English or I don't know which um, territories this will... Um, sell to but I'm about to play a, a lead role in a true crime drama um, where I actually get to play the villain this time mm. uh, so um, it's a, a big thrilling challenging role um, it's it's been quite a uh, intriguing true crime story in this country um, which uh, yeah people have been quite fascinated by so uh, Yes, I, I think the, if anyone wants to Google it, her name is um, Melissa Caddick and she was a Sydney businesswoman who defrauded her closest friends and family of million, millions of dollars, um, was eventually raided by the securities people, uh, disappeared, and then months later her decapitated foot turned up on a beach and um, scandals 
circulated about what had possibly happened to her and uh, it's been a bit of a, um, uh, you know, a criminal intrigue but also a, a story mm -hmm. about a lot of people who suffered deeply at the hands of this, this you know, very badly and, behaved woman. <laughs> and is that, a, is that a film or a miniseries? It's a miniseries, so it's what they'll call, you know, special event drama, you know. Um, yeah, so I'm I'm literally, I'm in Sydney now, which is where it's filming, and um, and I'm I pretty much just landed here. I'm in isolation, and then we'll get to work. Brilliant. Well, I'll look forward to seeing that. And and Pamela, have you got any projects that you're currently working on? This has been this is such an interesting time, uh, and uh, it's been a devastating time for live performance in um, yeah. around the globe. And um, in Australia, uh, I mean, I, I, I do quite a lot of stage work and um, that's been impacted hugely. Uh, in fact, I mean, where I broke my wrist was on a show that got shut down because uh, of a wave of COVID-19 that hit Sydney. Um, and then I rushed down to Melbourne and did my quarantine number five and then went into rehearsal for a stage play in Melbourne. And then again, Melbourne ended its fourth wave and we were all shut down so I, um it's pretty interesting that that kind of side of my career has um um been impacted and uh but i'm lucky i'm one of the lucky ones i've been shut down and you know whatever but at least i was being able to go to work uh but it's the knock-on effect is huge and i just had the news that one of my shows next year is cancelled and the other one's been postponed till 2023 and so this is a, going to be a really interesting time. Kate and I keep talking about doing projects together and we're really keen to oh, do we that. we will. We will. Well, now I've got the yeah. spinning in my head. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I've got a couple of other uh, projects coming up in, in the near future, but uh, just little bits and bobs, but it's going to be a very interesting 2023, I think. Oh. It was really um, devastating for live theatre. It really oh, yeah. I, Pam thought world, yeah. was following you around at one point. You'd done yes. isolation in about five different cities in an attempt to actually get on stage. Mm. It was really, really But I've, I've been lucky. I've been allowed to. I haven't had to do a hotel quarantine as several colleagues have had to do, but I've done six, but they've all been home quarantines. Um, it's, it's, it, that's, there's no problem with that. And, and as I said, um, each one of those quarantines represented a job somewhere, so I feel very lucky. We, we did have another question just pop up, um, asking whether you got to keep anything from the set. Did you take any mementos with you at the end? Yes. Mm -hmm. Or did you get, did you get, did you get to got, see that? Everyone got to take a teal tracksuit, even if you never wore one. So I, I've got a teal tracksuit. We just felt sure that years down the track we'd have a reunion. Because also you have to remember in the pandemic we didn't get to have any, um, there's been no rap parties, no launches, no, we've never... So there will be a reunion at one time and I'm sure everyone will turn up in their tracksuits. Um, but I, I kept every governor from Meg Jackson, so Kath McClements was only in one episode, Leanna Walsman, um, who played Erica Davidson, Joan Ferguson, Vera Ben. I kept all the governor's business cards, you know, those little cards on the, on the desk. Um, and we could keep our badges and stuff like that. Yeah, uh, and I, I, I've said this before, but I bought my straight jacket because I thought that would come in handy. <laughs> yeah. My <laughs> bottles. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I and I said I did. I, my, the first thing I took was a couple of my business, my Joan Ferguson, Governor Ferguson's um, business cards, and a bottle of Joan's hand sanitizer back when I'm. Um, I was was leaving the governor's office, uh, you know, to be occupied by some riffraff. Um, and then uh, uh, when the pandemic broke out, I thought, uh, yippee, I've got this mega litre bottle of hand sanitizer and rushed to the cupboard only to find out it was three years out of date. So it was no use whatsoever. So I thought this time I would I would try to souvenir something uh, of value, hence the straight jacket. Oh, and I have some yeah. of the... Um, Prisoner art, my first scene as governor, Danielle Cormack comes in and goes, what's that? And it's these dodgy bits of prisoner artwork. And I've got, I've got two of them in my kitchen. 
Oh, I like that. Great. That was another one of my favorite scenes was Joan as a prisoner and Teal coming to visit you in that office and just spending yeah. some time staring at these, trying to understand what was going on in Vera's mind. I have that on the wall. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for, for coming on and uh, chatting to us. And apologies for the, the, the slightly odd beginning, but we certainly made up for it afterwards. Mm. It has been an absolute ride. You know, as, as an audience member, um, it's been brilliant. Um, nine fantastic years, 100 amazing episodes. Um, Wentworth has been phenomenal. So thank you so much for all the amazing work you've done on the show. Thank you. And thank, thank you, you Joel. Yeah. And thank it's you, Joel. Yeah. Without the audience. So, um, yeah. yeah, it's, I'm, I am a little overwhelmed now. Now it's actually come to an end. I'm sure we'll have a, you know, hopefully we'll all meet in the flesh again one day, but it's, um, thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, we we'll, still get obviously, we, we desperately want to have you back over here in the UK as soon as that's, um, that's possible. And I hope you do all get to meet up as a cast and crew again and put on your, your teal tracksuits and party like you should have done at the end for the wrap party. So mm. and on that note, it's a wrap. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. We do it for you. And thank you for staying with us. What a wild ride. <laughs>